Hello and welcome to a new video. Today I'm going to talk about the Xu Xi legacy, give you a good introduction to them. What's changed compared to the Chinese civilization? New units, new bonuses, new dynasties, and just in general new landmarks as well. So there's a lot to look at here. I'll try to make it brief and give you a good overview. So let's get started. All right. So when we start off as the Xu Xi legacy, we'll find that our villages still retain the buffs to build 50% uh, faster and so on. But as you can see here, we are in a situation where we're spawning off with five villages. We're spawning in with an imperial official. Simply put, we have a different start now, which is going to make it so that the Xu Xi legacy aren't going to benefit in the same way from doing the wood mill drop off that is so popular as an opener for the Chinese. Instead, what we have is an instant mill opener, which is going to be something people have to get used to. Anyways, we also start off with a village and we also have access to spearmen in the Dark Age. We can build the spearmen here and we can build palace guards in the Feudal Age. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at the dynasties first. The dynasties are the same names. They are called the Tang Dynasty, Song Yuan, Ming. But the dynasties are different. They are still unlocked by building two landmarks from the same age. And you can build them in whatever order you want to. Nothing's changed there. The, the general structure of that system is the same. But the landmarks are different and the bonuses are different. You don't unlock the same units you would unlock normally. We don't have finances as an example. So let's take a look at it. Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty landmarks cost 15% less to construct. This means when we're going to go ahead and construct a landmark, both of these landmarks are going to cost 340, 170. This is a pretty big discount that does allow us to go for more greedy openers with these two. None of these are defensive landmarks. They're more passive. And well, some of them are good for aggressive play. You can go for one of them. You don't have to go Song Dynasty and get the Barbican up because we don't have a Barbican. So the Tang Dynasty is really good for that fast age up. The Song Dynasty, which we will get by building the two feudal landmarks, is going to make it so that all non-military buildings cost 40% less wood to construct. We get access to the granary. And so what you'll find is every single building down here that is not of the military type, the red that is going to be um, not discounted, but all the other ones will. So you'll build houses for 40% less. You'll build farms for 40% 40, 40 less. You'll build granaries for 40% less. You'll build full granary setups for 600 wood, which is absolutely insane. So you can boom really, really well with Song Dynasty. You're not going to get an increased villager production, but you'll get a really good reduction to wood. The Yuan Dynasty is going to provide us with pagodas. No finances, unfortunately. We'll get into that later. It's going to make it so that all units cost 10% less resources to produce, meaning we are in general going to be able to produce a lot more. We'll also need more production buildings to be able to uh, fit all that eco inside of our production when we unlock the Yuan Dynasty. This is going to be a good one in the mid game when you are going to start pumping out more advanced units that cost more. The Ming Dynasty is crazy. Ming Dynasty is absolutely splitting insane. Damage of Chinese unique units increases by 15%. This is a flat university upgrade almost right on top of all of your unique units. And you are probably going to be running primarily unique units. So this is quite a bonus to get from the Ming Dynasty. It's also expensive, of course. We are required to get two of the um, Ming Dynasty, so H4 landmarks. And that's going to be expensive. But if you can get it, your units just in general are buffed so much. That's it for the dynasties. We're going to go ahead and move on to the first two landmarks in the Feudal Age. We have access to the Xiangnan Tower and the Meditation Gardens. The Xiangnan Tower is a drop-off point for officials. It also creates a free unit of the type from the Barracks, Archer Range and Stable. So no Siege Workshop. Every time you build one. So let's go ahead and build the Xiangyang Tower. So there are no upgrades inside of the Xiangnan Tower, but let's take a look at how it works with the construction of buildings. Whenever I'm going to build a barracks here, a spearman will spawn. I'll build an archer range, a shugenu will spawn, and a stable will make a horseman spawn. Inside of the barracks, we have access to spearmen. Spearmen upgrade, we have access to palace guards in the feudal age. They look like this, and they are 
pretty, pretty good. They have three melee armor, which makes them really good in Fuel Age, but only two ranged armor. So they are going to be vulnerable to large amounts of archers. They're not going to be your standard melee 3-3 three, three stat uh, tanky unit that you can use in the Fuel Age, such as the English melee metal arms or the HRE ones. In the archer range, we have access to the Shugano, but no archers. So as you can see here, no hand cannons. We have no archers. And this is a bit of a problem. The Shugunus are, of course, slower. They don't attack from as far away as longbows, for example. So you'll find that the Shugunus aren't, in the first place, going to counter longbows, whereas archers would be a good addition in a, in a horseman composition to deal with, for example, an English rush. So the Shushi legacy will struggle, I predict, um, with English in general and other civilizations that have longer range uh, units because Shugunus simply aren't that good of a counter. Not having archers makes our compositions a little bit slower. So you are going to find that maybe you should play the civilization a little bit more defensively with focus on boom. In the stable, we have access to the horseman and a scout in the Feudal Age. The second Feudal Age landmark, which will unlock Song Dynasty for us, is the Meditation Gardens. And what it does is it has an area of effect where in within this radius, you will be able to get a constant trickle of resources based off the resources within that area. So if I'm going to go ahead and build the meditation gardens here on the berries, I'll get a 48 flat food per minute. If I build it between the berries and the, the stone, I'll get 30 stone and 48 food. And with the gold down here, I'll get 30 gold as well. So it's a really nice passive income landmark. So if you get Song Dynasty together with this and you put it on stone, for example, after pretty much just 10 minutes, so you'll be able to get a passive town center or just upgrades for your towers. If you put it on stone, you can also get those eco upgrades a little bit faster, a little bit more food. There's a lot of possibilities with this one and you can place it on a lot of resources. For example, over here, we have access to a lot of gold and a lot of food. Let's go ahead and plop it down. Let's unlock the Song Dynasty. We can see what we're talking about with the reduction. The reduction is going to make our farms cost 45. Our houses cost 30. And these are just going to be examples. Our village costs 75. TCs will cost 240 wood and 350 stone. So even with the TC nerf, this has got to be insane for, for booming because you can pump so many buildings out for so cheap. Let's go ahead and take a look at the new landmarks for the third age. These have been changed as well. So we have access to the Shaolin Monastery and the Mount Lu Academy. The Shaolin Monastery is a religious landmark and it acts as a monastery, but it produces a special unit called the Shaolin Monks. These cost 200 food and they're actually pretty strong. If you pit these up against Samurai, they'll actually be able to defeat them one by one. They have 15 base damage. They have 1.19 movement speed. They also have the ability to carry relics. So these guys here, they're good at fighting. They are also really good at regaining health when out of combat and they can carry relics. So this is overall a pretty strong landmark. You have the standard monastery land, uh, upgrades inside. The other landmark is the Mount Lu Academy. What it does is it makes Imperial officials collect tax twice as often and it also collects 20% of taxes as food. So if you place this one, let's say close to a full farm transition, you'll find that when the Imperial officials are collecting tax from there, which they will do by a lot, you'll get even more food than you would normally. So this is going to be a really strong landmark. From the Mount Lu Academy, we have access to four different upgrades and they're all eco-based upgrades. We have the Imperial official upgrade with the movement speed. It's called Single Whip Reform. It makes your Imperial officials move 50% faster, flat. The next one is regional inspection, making Imperial officials supervise for, instead of 150%, it will supervise at 300%. The next one is the military affairs bureau. It makes officials able to supervise keeps outposts, so they get a reduction in the damage taken by 35%. Then we have Imperial red seals, which increases your Imperial official limit by plus two. It also gives you an Imperial official upon completion. So this is a really, really strong one. In general, there's a lot of Imperial official upgrades there. One thing worth noticing is for the Pagodas, we are able to produce the Shaolin monks. The Pagodas are required Yuan Dynasty, and that means that you will have access to the Shaolin monks anyways. But the Shaolin monks can also be reduced here. From the standard monastery, we can only produce normal monks. Let's take a look at the H4 landmarks. 
we have access to Temple of the Sun and Shiyushi Library. The Temple of the Sun activates powerful abilities that improve speed, damage, range, and regeneration of units. We have four toggles here. The four toggles are Divine Haste, where infantry moves 15% faster. We have access to Divine Defense, where gunpowder units and defensive structure gain one range. We have access to Divine Charge, where cavalry units deal 20% damage. We have access to Divine Vitality, which makes units out of combat heal 2 health per second. That is really good. These upgrades are insane, and this landmark in general is going to be super good for your late game compositions. Whether you want to go Siege with the Divine Defense, or if you want to go with a lot of Palace Guards and flood your enemy, you can get that movement speed. You can also go heavy on the Cavalry, which we will talk about a little bit later, and you can go with Divine Vitality. The other landmark for H4 is the Shiyushi Library, and it has five upgrades to choose from. You can only pick two of them, but these upgrades are mad. So we have access to Roar of the Dragon. Roar of the Dragon is an Imperial upgrade at a thousand resources, and it is going to make your Spearmen and Horsemen gain a Fire Lance when they're charging. Just let that sink in. That is absolutely mental to think about. The next one is about as crazy as well. A 10,000 bolts is what the upgrade is called, and it makes your Shugenu and Crossbowmen fire an extra bolt, making Crossbowmen a lot stronger in the Imperial Age than normal. The Dynastic Protectors allows production of unique cavalry units, the Imperial Guard and the Yuan Raider. The next one here is Advanced Administration. The Advanced Administration makes Imperial Official gain 150 health, their maximum gold capacity will be increased by 80, and your Imperial Official limit is increased by 2. The next one is Cloud of Terror. Cloud of Terror adds an AoE damage to your Bombard, so when you fire with them, they almost act as manganals in terms of AoE. Let's take a look at the remaining units that we have not covered. When you get to the Imperial Age, you'll be able to produce Grenadiers as well. The Grenadiers do not require you to get the Ming Dynasty as it does with the Chinese original civilization. So, whereas you don't have access to hand cannons, you have access to Grenadiers. And we have access to two new units, the Yuan Raider and the Imperial Guard. The Yuan Raider is a really good raiding unit. Hence the name. The Yuan Raider is special because it has a lot of line of sight, as you can see. It also has 4 ranged armor. It has 15 base damage. And then it does plus 5 versus workers. It has 200 flat HP. So this is a really just overall good unit for raiding. And it also doesn't do too bad in fights, though it doesn't have any bonus damage. So from the Yuan Raider, you can really start doing some good raids with these once you're in Imperial Age. The next unit is the Imperial Guard. The Imperial Guard is very, very strong. The unit itself has 350 base health. It has 6 melee armor, 6 ranged armor, and a 35 base attack. Now, granted, these units cost 280 a pop instead of the 240. When it comes to Siege, nothing has changed besides we don't have access to the Clock Tower and we don't have access to the special Mr. B's upgrade, which means we are going to run property compositions that are just going to come out from the Siege Workshop as we aren't going to access the Siege automatically upon H3. Our Siege is also strong in the late game. This is overall a late game sieve and going to be really strong once you get to that point. I hope you've enjoyed this video about the Shu Shi Legacy. I think they're really interesting. They have a lot going on for them and play just so differently from the Chinese counterpart. I think that they are going to be super strong in the new season, but I'm pretty sure they will also see some changes. So let's see what happens with them. Overall, the structure seems great. The values and the way that are supposed to play with the focus on late game and an early uh, feudal. It's such a viable sieve for any type of player. So go ahead and try this one out. I would recommend it.